Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this particular lesson is for March 18 of 2023. It's lesson number 11. And this particular series, we only have 12 lessons, so this is the next to last lesson, entitled Managing in Tough Times. Think about experiences in the Bible that might be reg regarded as tough times. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you, recognizing your presence with us and your guidance as we look at these evidences, these stories, and the experiences of these individuals, what they might teach us about what's coming in the future. May we be prepared as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How can we deal with managing for our master in difficult times? Jim, I'll ask you to okay. take that one on. Sometimes our world seems to be spinning out of control. Wars, bloodshed, crime, immorality, natural disasters, pandemics, economic uncertainty, and political corruption, and more. There is a strong urge for individuals and families to think first of their own survival, according to much thought is given to seeking security in these uncertain times, uh, which, of course, is undesirable. Uh, excuse Understand me, understandable, understandable, excuse me. The toll of the life to take the, toil. the toils of life do take a lot of daily focus with debts to pay, children to raise, property to maintain. It does take time and thought. And of course, we do need clothes, food, and shelter. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addressed these very basic needs and then stated, Your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. as from Matthew 6 verses 32 and 33 from the New King James Bible. Yes, and also quoted from our teacher's guide. So let's ask the first question. How is God supposed to provide in our day? Does he mean that he will literally provide food and clothing and shelter? Or will he arrange for us to have the money to purchase these things in our society? Or will he give us opportunities for work to provide money for these things? Okay, there's three broad choices. What do you think? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> okay, how does he provide food, clothing, and shelter? Well, makes the garden grow, doesn't he? We recently were visiting in East Africa, and um, there the people live close to their gardens, and basically the lady that we were staying with would go out and pick a bunch of stuff out of her garden and come in. She'd cook some rice or something, and then... Here's all the stuff, food from her. And it's the good Lord that provides it, isn't it? I think you hear some stories in your missionary days where uh, no rain and there. Uh, oh, yes, in Africa. Stories. Right, right. And Africa, those, those things happen re pretty regularly. That part of Africa, yes. So. It happens well, pretty frequently here, too, but we, we aren't so dependent upon the immediate rain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what steps can we possibly take to alleviate these problems other than having a public water system and a public electricity system, etc.? Well, look at a time in Israelite history when things looked really bad. And Craig, would you be willing to read that for us? Sometime later, the armies of Moab and Ammon, together with their allies, the Minuites, invaded Judah. Some messengers came and announced to King Jehoshaphat, a large army from Edom has come from the other side of the Dead Sea to attack you. They have already captured Hazazan Tamar. This is another name for Engedi. Jehoshaphat was frightened and prayed to the Lord for guidance. Then he gave orders for a fast to be observed throughout the country. From every city of Judah, people hurried to Jerusalem to ask the Lord for guidance. And they and the people of Jerusalem gathered in the new courtyard of the temple. Let me interrupt you for a second now. Mm -hmm. How long do you suppose it would ta call, take for him to call all the people to Jerusalem? I would have thought that the army down in Gedi would be in Jerusalem by that time. 
Well, he just sent it out by email to everyone. And, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't and that they, be nice? And they zoomed Text. together. Text. <laughs> yeah. Text. yeah. Oh, maybe it. Maybe that isn't how it happened. Huh? No, I don't think so. I suppose they sent out soldiers, probably, to tell everybody and then spread that word on to others. But even so, for people to come with their families and so forth and gather in the courtyard in Jerusalem, I mean, that's a... It would take, a take a few days. That would take a little while. Okay, well, King Jehoshaphat. Okay. King Jehoshaphat went and stood before them and prayed aloud, O Lord God of our ancestors, you rule in heaven over all the nations of the world. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can oppose you. You are our God. When your people Israel moved into this land, you drove out the people who were living here and gave the land to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, to be theirs forever. They have lived here and have built a temple to honor you, knowing that if any disaster struck them to punish them, a war, an epidemic, or a famine, then they could come and stand in front of this temple where you are worshiped. They could pray to you in their trouble, and you would hear them and rescue them. Now the people of Ammon, Moab, and Edom have attacked us. When our ancestors came out of Egypt, you did not allow them to enter those lands. So our ancestors went round them and did not destroy them. This is how they repay us. They come to drive us out of the land that you gave us. You are our guide. You are our God. Punish them, for we are helpless in the face of this large army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do but we look to you for help. All the men of Judah with their wives and children were standing there at the temple. The Spirit of the Lord came upon a Levite who was present in the crowd. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. He was a member of the clan of Asaph and was descended from Asaph through Mataniah, Jeel, and Beniah. Jehaziel said, Your Majesty and all of you people of Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord says that you must not be discouraged or be afraid to face this large army. The battle depends on God, not on you. Mm. Attack them tomorrow as they come up the pass of Ziz. You will meet them at the end of the valley that leads to the wild country near Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Just take up your positions and wait. You will see the Lord give you victory. People of Judah and Jerusalem, do not hesitate or be afraid. Go out to battle, and the Lord will be with you. Let me interrupt again for a little bit. Now, how would something like that work out in our day? Is that the way we should have solved the problems in uh, Ukraine, for example? Would that work? My question is, how would we know, or how did the people at the time know that this was a prophet of God and not yeah. like the prophet, the quote prophet in First Kings 13. Yeah, or by all the other, the 850 prophets that were opposed to, to Elijah in their day. Yeah. They, hopefully it was because the, the king and everybody recognized that this guy was valid. I mean, Think about how would we respond if somebody showed up in church and said, I have a message from the Lord for all of you, and we would say, what would we say? <laughs> we'll find the nearest psychiatrist. <laughs> Very skeptical. <laughs> uh, but uh, will a day like this come fairly soon? Uh, I believe so. That's, that's what we're waiting for, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, Craig. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low, with his face touching the ground, and all the people bowed with him and worshipped the Lord. The members of the Levite clan of Kohath and Korah stood up and with a loud shout praised the Lord, the God of Israel. Early the next morning, the people went out to the wild country near Tekoa. As they were starting out, Jehoshaphat addressed them with these words, People of Judah and Jerusalem, Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will stand firm. Believe what his prophets tell you, and you will succeed. After consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put on the robes they wore. 
they wore on sacred occasions and to march ahead of the army singing, Praise the Lord, His love is eternal. When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. Now, I, uh, I try to imagine this in my mind. Uh, here's your army trying to attack the enemy, and who's out there in the front? The choir. <laughs> in uh, sacred robes. The choir led out many times. In yeah. uh, Jericho, they led out. Uh, yeah. Crossing the Jordan, they led out. Yeah, exactly. Well, we know that there were other prophets who weren't so reliable, as Gordon has already mentioned, right. but this message apparently was very valid because what happened? The enemy was defeated. Yeah. They ran. They, they turned and fought against each other. And when it was all done, the, the followers of Jehoshaphat, what did they do? Went out and collected the loot. Well, Judah was a small country surrounded by potential enemies. Three of those countries had come together to conquer Judah and put their own puppet. Uh, this was, right. though, the great uh, nephew of these, Abraham himself. <laughs> these are descendants of Abraham. All yes. of them. Well, no, they weren't. Some of them were, a couple of them were descendants of Lot. Right, and one, Moab was. One, that's, so that's why it's a great nephew. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is this. They're all relatives. They're all relatives. They're yeah. all, even to this day, they're relatives. Yeah. But um, there was uh, Levite. Now, Levites and Judah were not together, so he, you know, Judah and Benjamin were the southern well, kingdom. Ju so. Judah was supposed to be the, the kingly line. Right. And, and the Levites were the priestly line. Yes, of course, but then yeah. the, the kingdom had divided already, the northern and the yeah, southern. Yeah, the northern, yeah. northern kingdoms, that's right. That's so good. Levites were really in the north. No, they weren't. They were not. They were Some were. They were oh, well, yes, they what were. happens is, remember that their income was dependent upon the temple. Yes. So most of the Levites migrated to the south when the two countries, when the two nations they split. Did. Right. So they were really technically, maybe at the very beginning in the north, but many of them migrated to the south. But they could really own land almost anywhere within yeah. Israel. Well, and of course, the original plan was for them to o oper operate, I'm sorry, occupy the cities yes. of refuge right. yeah. and have some territory around the cities of refuge. But they were scattered out through the different tribes. And why was that? They were the civil government. They were the educational people and so forth. So they, they were supposed to be doing those kinds of things for everybody, not just for themselves. And the people didn't pay the tithe that they were supposed to, so the Levites had to support themselves. Yeah. Then we see the name Korah there. Mm-hmm. This is their, his descendants. Right. And if you go back and look carefully, his descendants did not perish when the earth opened up. Right, right. He perished, but his descendants did not perish. Yeah. Well, don't, believe that, don't we believe that that same God is our God today? Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah depended upon the word of the prophet to save them. Are we able to do that today? We, we, we talk about a time of trouble coming. Is, can we depend upon the prophet's word at that point in time? Well, let me ask you a tougher question. You were all... Since we were so good with that one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How would you compare the trust or faith that Jehoshaphat and his people had back in those days with the average level of faith that you see in, let's say, the Seventh-day Adventist Church today? Might, yeah. I, might I comment on that? Sure. Jehoshaphat and the people of that particular time had something going for them that we do not have. Mm -hmm. The Messiah was coming through yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And nothing too haywire could go wrong until after the Messiah was birthed. Yeah. And so David... Did they and, think they recognized that? No. And so with or without them being faithful, mm -hmm. the Messiah was coming. There's and a lot see, of... That's, that is something they... That, basically, they had a, a no-fault policy. Yeah, yeah. 
But then we have a one even better. He's coming back. But not through us. <laughs> not a descendant of us. Well, I wouldn't, not everyone who, quote, descended in that line will end up being saved. But they nevertheless were in the line. Well, uh, Gordon, could you take from on? The, the, from the Bible study guide, teacher's section, Jehoshaphat had riches and armies, but they were no match for the unexpected crisis that threatened them, that threatened him. The crisis was greater than anything he had prepared for. However, Jehoshaphat trusted in God and prophetic guidance, and his story became a testimony of great divine deliverance, as recorded in what uh, we read. This incredible story is a lesson for the Adventist church to trust in God and in the prophetic guidance it has received. And there's several okay. references given, including Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 19, 10. And you remember, if you studied in Adventist schools a number of years ago, that those are the proof texts that we are the true church. Until you get a different translation. Well, that's a problem, too. <laughs> well, after reading the story of Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel, shouldn't the final group of God's faithful people be able to trust God as much as Jehoshaphat did? How much evidence do we have? They, they didn't have the story of Jesus to look back to. We do. Well, don't we have a prophet upon whom we should rely who has given us very clear and specific counsel for the final days? So let's read those verses and see what you think. Now, this is from a different translation, as you've, Gordon has already suggested. Charles, you want to take those two for us? Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was furious. Yeah, there is wrath and then there's furious with the woman and went to, uh, off to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and the faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. This good news Bible. Okay. Is that us? Is that us? That's the question. Are we, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Well, go ahead. Revelation 19.10, this goes with it. I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do it. I am a servant together with you and with your fellow believers, all those who hold to the truth that Jesus revealed, worship God. For the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets. Good News Bible. Okay, do we have an inspired prophet? among us? Well, we claim that we did. Or is it possible that the message that he's talking about there is for all of us to carry? Are all of us supposed to be spreading the third angel's message? Supposed to be. Yes. Supposed to be. Well, that wasn't what you were supposed to say. You were supposed to give a ringing testimony. <laughs> Well, as a young man, prior to be, being king, David was very close to God. God himself described David as a man after my own heart. That's described in, back in 1 Samuel and also in Acts 13. So 1 Samuel 14, 1 to 23, describes a time when Jonathan, the son of King Saul and David's best friend, went out with his armor bearer and led a conquest that beat the Philistines. Surely David understood the details of that story, but what happened when David wanted to prepare his people to fight against his enemies? Now, let's stop for a second. Of all the leaders that Judah, that the Israelites had, maybe following, not, maybe not counting Moses and, and Joshua, but all the kings and prophets and judges that came afterwards, nobody was as successful as David, right? Can you think of anybody else who was as successful? I mean, he spread the territory of Judah from Egypt to the Euphrates. The way it was supposed to be. The way it was supposed to be. Yes. Yeah. Except not the way it was supposed to be done. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He did. Yes. He did. So we would say he was a successful military leader, right? Yes. Very successful military leader. So, he, and he knew about the story of Jonathan. 
So, you know, God can conquer a whole group of people with just guidance from two people. But what did he do when he decided that he wanted to go out and conquer some more enemies? <laughs> First Chronicles 21, 1 to 14. Let's just review the story. Satan wanted to bring trouble. How did he get into this story? Mm -hmm. Satan wanted to bring trouble on the people of Israel, so he made David decide to take a census. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that censuses were taken earlier, back in the book of Numbers. God told him to do that. So this is not just automatically a wrong thing. David gave orders to Joab and the other officers. Go through Israel from one end of the country to the other and count the people. I want to know how many fighting men there are. Joab answered, May the Lord make the people of Israel a hundred times more numerous than they are now. Your majesty, they are all your servants. Why do you want to do this and make the whole nation guilty? But the king made Joab obey the order. Jo Joab went out, traveled through the whole country of Israel, and then returned to Jerusalem. He reported that king, to King David the total number of men capable of military service, 1,100,000 in Israel and 470,000 in Judah. Because that's that's quite a mm, quite a number. Because Joab disapproved of the king's command, he did not take any census in the tribes of Levi. Of course, they were supposed to be the priests and Benjamin. Anybody have an idea why he didn't number Benjamin? I've never figured that one out. The tribe of the former king. Yes. Well, God was displeased with what they had been done, so he punished Israel. David said to God, I have committed a terrible sin in doing this. Please forgive me, I have acted foolishly. Then the Lord said to Gad, David's prophet, by the way, how would it be to have a personal prophet? Mm -hmm. Well, a number of general conference presidents had trouble with a prophet we had back in those days. <laughs> They banished her to another continent. Not only that. Was it just because she was a woman or was it because of her message? Message. It was the message. Or both. So if there was such great trouble at the time, what else do you expect now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, because she was, Ellen White was already <coughs> giving pretty serious comments about how things should be done, and some of the brethren weren't too happy about it. Well, even the great controversy, the book itself, mm -hmm. is being questioned now by the powers that may be. You know, I, yeah. I just very recently I listened to one of these, and it's Ministry Magazine itself. Yeah. Then the Lord said to Gad, David's prophet, go and tell David that I'm giving him three choices. I will do whichever he chooses. Gad went to David, told him what the Lord had said, and asked, which is it to be, three years of famine, three months of running away from the armies of your enemies, or three days during which the Lord attacks you with his sword and sends an epidemic on your land, using his angel to bring death throughout Israel? What answer shall I give the Lord? Now, what would be the purpose of these three things? <laughs> You get rid of a bunch of the soldiers that you just counted, right? To show God's displeasure. David replied to Gad, I'm in, des in a desperate situation, but I don't want to be punished by people. Let the Lord himself be the one to punish me, because he is merciful. So the Lord sent an ep epidemic on the people of Israel, and 70,000 of them died. Okay. 70,000 out of over 1.5 million fighting men. Yes. Well, note that it was Satan's idea to count the soldiers. At least that's what it says in Chronicles. But David commanded it done. What about the conflicting message found in 2 Samuel 24, 1, talking about the same experience? Here it says, the Lord was angry with Israel once more, and he made David bring trouble on them. The Lord said to him, go and count the people of Israel. Hold on. Who did what here? The Lord did. <laughs> That's what it says. But Chronicles says Satan did. So who's right? Chronicles or Samuel? They're both right. It's written by the same? No. no, probably not. Chronicles was probably written quite a long time later by Ezra 
as a summary of what had happened. Greg, you sound like you're going to give me an answer here. No, I consider both to be correct. Yes? Help us. God is often given credit for what he allows. Yeah. Or blame. Yeah, or blame. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and um, so this is something he allowed. And he allowed it for a specific purpose. <clears throat> David says, at least, well, let me not make that comment because you're probably going there. Well, okay. No one ever, and our Bible study guide says, no one ever trusted God in vain. Whenever you do battle for the Lord, prepare yourself. And prepare well, too. There's a quote attributed to a British ruler, Oliver Cromwell by name, who ruled from, well, lived from 1599 to 1658, who before a battle said to his army, put your trust in God, my boys, and keep your powder dry. Of course, the powder was gunpowder. In other words, do all that you can to succeed, but in the end realize that only God can give you victory. Is that a valid statement even today? Yes. I think so. Well, the story of David's failure when trying to count his potential soldiers and it ended relatively well despite his sins. Notice these words at the end of the story. First Chronicles 21, 26. Jim, can you read that for us? He built an altar to the Lord there and offered bird offerings and fellowship offerings. He prayed and the Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn the sacrifices on the altar, asking God to stop the epidemic. Okay. Says in brackets. So here's, here's the people in Jerusalem gathering around. Okay, what's going to happen? Are we going to die? What's happening with this epidemic? David gets some sacrifices. He offers them. And bam, there's lightning out of heaven consuming the sacrifice. Um, what would happen if a pastor today commanded something and there was lightning out of heaven? Would uh, that get people's attention? Well, Satan could do it too. Yeah, Satan could. <laughs> we have become skeptics now. You yeah, know, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, how would it affect your health, if you, your faith, I'm sorry, if you saw God send fire from the sky and consume an offering pre presented to him? How often are we tempted to trust in government or our personal finances or our friends when faced with difficult times? Are we honestly preparing for the difficult times when we believe, which we believe are soon to come? How can we properly balance in our minds the challenges of providing for, for the necessities of the present time? I mean, God expects us to care for our families, right? With some financial security, and yet at the same time, trust God for everything. Is there any reason why preparing the best way for any crisis that might develop should prevent us from trusting in the Lord? Might the Lord help, help us to prepare for a crisis? Yes. Craig, did we cover what you were going to say? Um, in part. Um, so say the rest. When the people asked for a king during Samuel's time, mm -hmm. God told them what a king would do. And basically telling them, whatever he does, you're going to be held responsible for. Mm -hmm. So even though they looked like they were innocent in this situation, they were as arrogant as David was and as responsible for the angels striking, let's say the plague coming, as David was responsible. So they weren't as innocent as we might at first assume. God told them before the first king ever showed up, this is what these guys are going to do. Yep. And you're going to pay a terrible price for it. And yeah. there you go. Way back in the days of Moses. Go back to Deuteronomy. He, he warned them what was going to happen. Well, some Adventists who have studied the time of trouble in detail have said the time of trouble is actually a great time to be alive. Do you look forward to surviving through the great time of trouble? Yeah, well, he promised, but he says some of us are going to be put to sleep. Mm-hmm. Also? Right. But he promised that I'm with you always, even to the end. So today, in our days, where we're still pretty comfortable, these are not a time for hunkering down and trying to hide. 
This is a time for using our resources to spread the gospel to the ends of the world. Remember that whatever is left over will be burned up. I, I like what Emilio Kennedy used to say, you know that name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he used to say, when Noah was done building the ark, he was broke. <laughs> 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 All he needed to do is to get in the boat, so. Yeah, he had to. <laughs> Greg, would you be willing to read that Second Peter for us? Okay, verse... 7, 3 through 3, Second <clears throat> Peter 3, 7 and 12. Well, the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him, the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. Okay, that's a pretty serious comment, isn't it? What kind of, um, what kind of heat would it take to melt heavenly bodies? Nuclear. Nuclear. How long will it take for a person to build up, to burn up if there were nuclear fire? No time. Nanoseconds. Instant time. Ellen White comments there. Gordon? From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. She says, We ought now to be heeding the injunction of our Savior. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old a treasure in the heavens that faileth not. It is now that our brethren should be cutting down their possessions instead of increasing them. Mm. Hmm. We are 18, about... 1882, that was. Uh, we are about to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Again, that's 140 years ago. Mm -hmm. Or more. Then let us not be dwellers upon the earth, but be getting things into a compact, be getting things into as compact a compass as possible. Page 152.1. Okay, so what does that imply? Yes. Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, those who were in the ministry within our denomination years ago were given the option of going into Social Security mm -hmm. or going out of. Mm -hmm. I was a very young worker at that time and um, didn't really have financial advisors around, et cetera, et cetera. But my wife and I, praying and asking the Lord for guidance, we decided to go with Social Security. Mm -hmm. Now, those who didn't were operating on some very, what they thought, solid church understandings. The Lord is coming soon. Yeah. We will not live long enough for Social Security to be an issue. Yes, I remember those days. And some of those men are very elderly now. Mm -hmm. And they are having a hard time. Yep because the denomination refuses to undo what they did. You had the choice. You chose not to. Mm -hmm. That's your fault. Yeah. That's not our fault. I mean, it's legitimate, but these men made that decision because they thought the Lord is coming. So when do we unload our things? When do we? Yes. That's well, a question. That's what comes up next. We have, may have good genes and live a healthy life and live to be 100. However, none of us knows for sure when our last moments of life will occur. 
Well, I, I need to, I just cannot yeah. walk away from hearing what you, I'd never, I grew up in Adventism, pastor's son, on the other side, other side of the world, but I've never heard this before. Yeah. This, what you just described, makes me sad and perhaps even be angry, you know, I mean, this is not right. These are the folk who really, truly trusted. There's no ready-made answer of it. Um, the denomin I, I, I need to make it clear, the denomination did not do the workers wrong. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it set yeah. it out there and they decided. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is those who decided not to go with Social Security had no idea was how little they would get in retirement income. Right. Yeah. They had no idea. Well, uh, and they probably had no idea how little they would get in Social Security either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to be, yeah, well, I mean, but it's, it's but better less, than nothing. But even you know, this folk. The church. Trusted in the Lord, they, yes. uh, uh, they, in true faith, they went this way. And me, as a faithful member of the Seventh Adventist Church, it, it hurts me to hear this. It may not bother yeah. other people, but it does. Okay, let me add something. And once we close our eyes in death, well, however, none of us knows for sure when our last moments of life will occur. And once we close our eyes in death, the next instant when we awake, we will see Jesus. Remember that whatever we accumulate on this earth is only transitory and fleeting. The only thing that have e things that have eternal value are those which are stored up in heaven. What if you had some idea about when Jesus would come? Maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20? Ellen White had some very clear words on that. Charles, you want to share that? We are not to, what are we? Uh, we, are, we are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. You will not be able to say that he will come in one, two, or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by standing, by stating that it may not be for 10 or 20 years. Ellen White, Review and Herald, March 22, 1892. Okay, so that was in the Review and Herald, sent to all Adventists. In 1892, sent it from Australia. Are we willing to accept the very clear words of Scripture and Ellen White that we cannot straddle the fence? It is not possible to serve God and money. We have to make a clear choice. Are we committing the largest portion of our worldly goods to God's cause? Okay, what verses do we have to support that? Matthew 6, 24. No one can be a slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And our Bible study guide carries on. Notice Jesus didn't say that it was hard to serve God and money or that you needed to be careful in how you serve both. He said instead that it couldn't be done, period. This thought should put a bit of fear and trembling in our souls. Is that what it does to you? From no, our, I, I cannot help it but make a comment. Uh, the way we are going um, in certain countries, many countries, uh, we have to shift. We have to make some dramatic, drastic changes. We have no, I asked the secretary of the division of one of the world churches, uh, divisions, a very good friend of mine, and uh, I say, uh, what kind of work do we have among the elite of this country with 1.2 billion people? Without hesitancy, once, right away, he says, none. None. Mm -hmm. And yet we have the audacity to say even so come Lord Jesus we have mm. we don't so I, I think I think uh, what's the word uh, I think time is coming and it's very close by when not the usual way of reaching out is we, we need some some new and innovative ways oh absolutely so what things are actually making it hard for us to look to God as our only source of hope Jim 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. 
Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sin, excuse me, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of the, our, excuse me, will of the of God. God live forever. Excuse me. Good news, Bible. Okay. That's not easy. The things of the world are all around us. Satan has determined to make them as attractive as possible. I, I have friends who go to the movies. Well, not real often, but sometimes. And um, they're not Seventh-day Adventists, but they go to, go to the movies. And the, 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 the things that the movie industry is doing now to make it as attractive as possible is just, I mean, beyond belief. And I can tell you that, that pretty soon you're going to go, pretty much every movie, you're going to go and you're going to have 3D glasses. And the thing is going to be, you know, like you're right in it. That's coming. Well, what does the newborn say when it's born? You know, it says, what is my iPad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two-year-old kids want um, iPads. So, so what's the world coming? And the amazing thing is they know how to use them. They you are just right. <laughs> so, Colossians 3, 2. Keep your minds fixed on things there, talking about heaven, not on things here on earth. Is that possible? How can you survive if you do that? That's a, that's a big challenge. Well, Revelation 12 to 14 are the central and most important chapters of the book of Revelation. They are the message that Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to be taking to the entire world. What do they tell us? those three angels' messages. First of all, we will be faced by the fury of three huge forces. Satan himself, Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Two, the first beast, Revelation 13, 1. And three, the second beast of Revelation 13, 11 to 13. Some of the Adventists have been taught that the first beast represents Roman Catholic and Orthodox Christianity while the second beast represents apostate Protestants. In other words, there will be an enormous force against those who remain faithful to God by following his instructions. How bad could things get? Are these future times going to be worse than the world wars? Worse than the Holocaust? Worse than the Black Plague? Worse than any pandemic? Well, Satan will absolutely be doing everything he possibly can to destroy or at least discourage God's faithful people. And you know, in the book of Revelation, there are two enormous powers fighting each other, God and those on his side versus Satan and those on his side. And, and I think you're going to agree with me that Revelation chapter 12, 14, in fact, the entire book of Revelation is about one thing, worship. Mm -hmm. Who gets our worship? Yep. And it, the world was split. Some will go this way and some will go that way. And what does worship really mean? It's you value the yeah. message that he has. It yeah. is not that he desires somebody to fall down in it's front of him. That's, that's a very human. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that, that's my take on it. No, you're right. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Who has Daniel 12? Uh, that's Craig. Craig. <clears throat> the angel wearing linen clothes said, at that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation whose names are written in God's book will be saved. Good news, Bible. Okay, so let's just be clear. I'm not going to take, we don't have time to discuss this. Satan will, at that point in time, his full attention and all the people on his side, Revelation 13 spells this out, 
their number one job is to eliminate God's faithful people. That's their, their, their goal. And God has said, you can do whatever you want except eliminating my people. You will not be allowed to kill them. You can cause them trouble if you want, but you can't kill them. And that will be the great time of trouble. Well, let us understand very clearly that the devil and all those who will be on his side are determined to destroy or kill, to make it impossible for God's faithful people to live. Remember there in Revelation 13, it says, kill everybody who's opposed to us, and then they won't be able to buy or sell. Well, that's going to be pretty serious, right? Will we have the courage and faith to stand firm? The more of this world's goods or material wealth that we have in our possession at that time, the harder it will be for us to turn away from those things and remain faithful to God. Many verses in Scripture teach us that we are to fear the Lord. What does that mean? Well, in the Bible, the word translated fear can mean anything from abject terror to respect, worship, or honor. The correct translation must be determined by the context. You remember the, the first angel's message is what? Fear the Lord in the traditional translation. So, Gordon. In the Bible study guide, though nothing in the Bible warns against wealth, nothing in the Bible talks about wealth as increasing one's spiritual commitment either. In fact, the opposite danger is true. An Elohite comment? from uh, Steps to Christ, page 44. Whatever shall draw away the heart from God must be given up. Mammon is the idol of many. The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the great ch it is the golden chain that binds them, that is the people, to Satan. Reputation and worldly honor are worshiped by another class. The life of selfish ease and freedom from responsibility is the idol of others but these slavish bands must be broken. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. Again, steps to Christ. Wow. So our Bible study guide says, in fact, since the founding of Christianity, no church has ever partaken of such wealth and creature comforts as the church in many countries of the world enjoy today. The question is, at what cost? Such affluence surely influences our spirituality and not for the good either. How could it? Since when, ha since when have wealth and material abundance fostered the Christian virtues of self-denial and self-sacrifice? Can coming home to refrigerators stuffed with more food than we can eat, and owning one or two cars, and taking yearly vacations, and shopping online, and having the latest in home computers and smartphones, make it easier to love not the world, nor the things in the world. And I'm going to interrupt my own reading there for just a moment. I am convinced that as evil as the Internet has proved for many people, it will end up being, well, we know it's already being used as a great method for spreading the gospel to places we couldn't otherwise reach. So. It's not the tool that's the problem, it's how it's used. Think of Theox.org. Yeah. Where our materials are posted. Yeah. Though many members of our church don't have these luxuries, many do, and they do so at the peril of their own souls. We're not talking about the rich now as in the millionaires and beyond. They at least know that they're rich and they can heed, if they choose, the biblical cautions given them. We're talking instead about many even of the middle class people who um, amid smartphones, iMacs, air conditioning, and SUVs are fooled enough to think that because they are just middle class, they are not in danger of being spiritually pickled by their own prosperity. That's why tithing can be, if nothing else, a powerful spiritual antidote to the dangers of wealth, even for those who are not particularly wealthy. That's a pretty potent statement from the Bible study guide for Friday. What would happen to you and your family if these bad conditions we have talked about happened suddenly and earthly comforts disappeared beginning tomorrow? 
Well, here's something right out of our recent news. With the United States government getting ready to eliminate cash because it, is, because it is the main currency used by drug dealers and other criminals, our current government is trying to force everyone to use credit cards and other electronic tr credit transfer devices so that every transaction can be traced. It is not hard to see how anyone to see how anyone that the government wants to shut down will be at their mercy. And we refer again to Revelation 13, 15 to 17. Is it not clear from what we have stated already that putting our trust in God will be the only means of salvation when things get tough? How many of us are looking to this world's riches as a way of displaying our wealth? Are we willing to live lives as modest, modest temperate people with out ostentation, 1 Timothy 2.9. Having wealth and wanting wealth is a great reason for anxiety. 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. Wow. If that was true in the days when Christians were, you know, it, even, it was a death sentence even to be known as a Christian. What about today? Today we have the opportunity of investing in God's cause. We can, quote, store money in the treasure house of heaven. What other investments could possibly compare? Many examples could be given from the Bible to suggest that those who are faithful, even in small things, are regarded as God's friends and will be helped by him. Luke 16, 10 puts it this way, whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. So what are the challenges of worldly wealth? Jim? Sometimes money issues deprive us of sleep. It's Ecclesiastes 5, 12. Attract thieves, Matthew 6, 19. Bring false friends, Proverbs 14, 20, <laughs> Proverbs 19, 4. Give rise to greed, Ecclesiastes 4, 8, and Ecclesiastes 5, 10, and may lead to self-conceit, Proverbs 28, 11, or indifference toward others. We cannot set our heart on riches. Additionally, bankruptcy may sometimes be avoidable. Unavoidable. And, unavoidable and painful. So it always is wise to remember that it is better to have little in the Lord, excuse me, have little in the Lord than right. much, excuse me, than and much with trouble. Okay, the, that's the wording. Bible study guide. Yeah. Okay. The wording there is from the King James yeah. Version. It doesn't flow very good. We believe that ultimately God is responsible for everything that happens. Either we talked about this earlier, he either does it, did it, or he allows or allowed it. Our Bible study guide says, <coughs> Greg, can you look at that for us? In the Hebrew mindset, God is ultimately in control of everything. References Daniel 4 and Isaiah 46. Not even a sparrow perishes without the Father knowing it, Matthew 10. Everything happens only by divine permission or will, which at the same time respects individual choice and responsibilities. 2 Samuel 24 and Deuteronomy 30. That's from our Bible study guide. That, that top line there is God is in control of everything. God allows that's an awful lot to happen. That's and the I'm, I'm, uh, it's just their, that's their understanding. Because in Genesis 1, take dominion. Two times there in Genesis 1. And does that mean, that, but if you don't do my bad, I'm going to get in there and mess it up for you? No, it's... Uh, I like the, the statement, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows that uh, Craig just mentioned earlier yeah. today. Think about times when God's people down through the generations have been in special trouble. One example was clearly the time in Egypt when Pharaoh was determined to keep them as his slaves. Read the following passages and see what we can learn about how God relates to stubborn people. Gordon? In the Bible study guide, when Pharaoh hardened his own heart, that is Exodus 8, 15, 19, and 32, the Bible at times ascribes this action to God 
as in Exodus 10:20, 20, 27, and Exodus 11:10, showing that God permitted Pharaoh to make his own choices. God restricts evil, but ultimately the individual makes the decision and bears the responsibility for his or her choices. It's from the Bible study guide. Yeah. And and Exodus now he, 934, Exodus 934 to 10.1. And notice who does what here. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may, I may perform these signs of mine among them. That's okay, the so, International. so here's a, what, four verses or something like that, and it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, his heart was hardened, and God hardened his heart. Are those things? It? Huh? Who did it? Who did it? Is that consistent? Well, have you had personal experiences in which you felt it was necessary to turn to God for deliverance? What did you learn from these experiences? It is not only monetary wealth that can be a problem for us to, uh, to but fame and power. Knowledge, power, fame, physical beauty, and positions of influence without the fear of the Lord may lead to negative consequences similar to those resulting from acquiring riches without the blessing or help of God. Therefore, we need to appreciate divine wisdom more than any material gift. Okay, and there's references there. It's not only the wealthy who have problems, but also the rest of us. The devil is more than happy to cause problems to every group of people. An excessive lack of money also causes harm, given that it has the opposite effect of riches. The poor are persecuted, despised, and exploited. That is why those who are wise pray for balance. God is Lord of the rich and the poor. He doesn't despise the poor for being poor because his own son came as a rich, uh, came as a poor man among the poor. Neither does God favor the rich because they are rich, for all riches are his. And we're coming to the end of our time here, so I'll draw a conclusion that let you make, draw your own conclusions from, from this lesson. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have looked at some very challenging ideas, some challenging messages from the Bible and from Ellen White. Help us to take them to heart, to understand them in the way you want us to understand them, and may we do what we can to promote the near coming for your of your near coming is our prayer in Jesus name amen